thank you for joining us this morning for our city council study session. We'll go ahead and get started. Ruth, could you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Addison? Here. Ray? Here. Cheetah? Here. Lurick? Here. Ortega? Here. Stevens? Here. Black? Here. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to agenda item number two is a golf advisory committee update. Representatives from the golf advisory committee will discuss the committee's goals and projects as well as council's policies and expectations. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Larry Morton. I'm the current chair of the golf advisory committee. Our committee members are made up of Vice Chair Billy Satterfield, Ginger Smith, Danielle Maybe, Roger Musser, Thomas Little, and Greg Albright of Four Golf. Additional Four Golf representatives are Gerald Myler and Brian Sprague. I'd like to also thank Councilman Roger Bray, our council liaison for participation and his support of the committee. The Golf Advisory Committee continues to be very active in working with golf concessionaire and city staff regarding the appearance and condition of the golf courses and the quality of the golfing experiences for the com community, as well as strategies to increase play at the courses. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank the mayor and the council for your past support and your current support in this fiscal year, particularly for your approval of capital resources to continue accumulation of funds for the eventual Riverside Clubhouse replacement and other continuing course, cart path, and clubhouse improvements and enhancement, enhancements. Some of the recent uh, accomplishments over the past couple of years are uh, including addressing the water hammer issues at the Riverside Golf Course, extensive cart path renovations and replacements, the Highland Clubhouse repainting, clubhouse flooring replacements, replacement of AC units at both clubhouses, extensive tree pruning at Highland and Riverside, as well as tree, uh, selected tree removals, uh, needed plumbing and electrical repairs at both clubhouses, and we've installed new yardage markers at both courses. A play report for the 2019 season and the year-to-date season of 2020 in 2019, till rounds played were 49,278. Uh, as compared uh, in 2018 to 51,595 rounds, and in 2017, 51,386 rounds. So we were down a little bit uh, in 2019. Uh, season pass holders, accounted for approximately 66% of the total rounds played in 2019, with daily fee rounds making up approximately 34%. 2019 total season passes were 654, compared with 713 in 2018 and 747 in 2017. Now the numbers get a little bit better for 2020. Ongoing COVID circumstances created some challenges during the early part of the 2020 season. However, things have stabilized and play levels have been consistently good. Tournament activity resumed uh, around June 13th under comprehensive safety guidelines. Participation in tournaments has been very good. League play is also going very well. Through July 2020, year to date, total rounds of 36,561 compared with 2019 of 30,472 and 2018 of 30,756. So we're up almost 6,000 rounds so far this year. Uh, through July 2020, season pass sales are 632 compared in that same period in 2019 to 605 and 2018, 641. So we're pretty stable with past sales. Um, I'll turn turn it over for a moment to uh, Greg Albright and Gerald Myler. They'll, they'll talk a little bit about strategies they've implemented to increase play.
Good morning, Council, Mayor. Thanks for the opportunity to meet with you. Um, I can't see you all very good because when I put my glasses on, they fog up with the mask. So, uh, so um, this year has been an, an interesting challenge for everyone, and, and uh, we have certainly felt that in, in the golf business. Um, we've been fortunate in that we've been able to attract a number of, of new golfers and new rounds for this year. And as Larry mentioned, we're up about 6,000 rounds versus the last two years. Uh, some of the things that we've done include expanding some of our season pass offerings. For example, we never had a family pass until a year or two ago. And with the help of the advisory board committee and Councilman Bray, we formulated an idea to come up with a family pass and also a combo pass, senior combo pass. So when you look at a few of those numbers, some of them appear to be down, but it's actually uh, the effect of having two people buy one combo pass versus two people buy a separate pass in previous years. We've had 14 family passes sold this year, which isn't tremendous. We're looking for an increase there, obviously, but it's, it's ticking upward from nine last year. So as, as we get the word out and as people realize what a great activity golf can be, uh, those numbers are coming up. The combo passes have been a bigger hit for the seniors, and we've had 39 senior combo passes this year. So uh, as far as daily rounds, Larry mentioned that typically about two thirds of our play is from season pass holders. The rest is from daily fee play. And we've done a number of things to try to attract and improve daily fee play, including discounted play on weekdays, Monday through Thursday, which is a time that historically has been hard to fill tee times. For. Um, we've had discounts through uh, the local uh, uh, coupon, booklets and coupon booklets and advertising that we've done, some advertising we've done on television. Uh, and we continue to look for great ideas to, to to increase and improve daily fee play, and certainly we're all ears when it comes to those sorts of ideas. So as the council and the mayor review some of these, these uh, facts, um, certainly if you have an idea, come up to Greg or I afterward, or John or Larry, and we'd, we'd be glad to consider good ideas. So I think 2020 has been a success in, in the local golf business. Um, we thank you for your support and ongoing support, and turn it over to Greg. Yeah, is there any questions I can answer with regard to tournament play or what we've gone through with the whole COVID issues? I'm wondering if there's a difference in play between Highland and Riverside. They're pretty consistent with play. Um, I guess if a customer is wanting to get out and get some exercise and walk, then Riverside is an easier golf course to walk. Um, as Gerald alluded to, I mean, our, our play numbers have been up. Um, as long as we've had good weather conditions, we've had really busy days. We had a little bit of too much rain in June, but aside from that, things have been really busy. So we've been very fortunate to be in open because we've had folks looking for an activity to do. Unfortunately, golf has been one of those activities that has, that has remained open. So we've done our part on trying to do whatever we needed to do to protect our customers as well as our employees. Uh, I think it would behoove us to also know that um, you work with Fish and Game to get rid of the geese on the golf course. Right. Uh, a creative partnership uh, cost us a little bit for their investment there, but the geese can make it miserable to walk. And, uh, so, yeah, and we're trying to do our part as well. Um, they provided me with a, a gun with blanks and that. I always inform the police department, hey, I'm going to be out on the golf course. <laughs> I'm not out there shooting geese, but I'm just keeping them moving around. And that's that was a recommendation from the wildlife services. 
try to keep harassing the geese, to keep trying to move them around, and they they relocated them last year. It worked really well. Really didn't see any geese come back. Relocated them this year. We've seen a few return, so I guess all we can do is our part of just continue to harass the geese. Otherwise, they're going to feel really comfortable there, and they, they feel safe. Does the water problem on the, that one hole still a problem? The overflow from those overflow ponds? Um, no, the city's done it, along with our maintenance staff, has done a really good job of pumping the water out. I don't know if that's the ultimate um, resolution, but for right now we're doing okay. We haven't had any overflow or anything out of the golf course. So we're doing okay. Okay. Yeah, Chris. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. Um, could you remind me of what the total estimated cost of the Riverside Clubhouse renovation is and where we are in terms of, um, you know, money that's, that's... Um. We estimate the, the cost of the Riverside Clubhouse replacement at, at roughly a million dollars. Um, as time goes, I, I guess those, those estimates would tend to kind of tick up a little bit. Uh, uh, the mayor and I and, and Four Golf did uh, present a uh, partnership proposal to Premier Technologies um, a while back. Uh, the initial indications were that they were interested and um, we, we have not been able to secure the partnership to date. Um, with uh, the COVID that hit, we're kind of, um, it, it was a large ask. We were asking for half a million dollars for naming rights and other benefits. Um, we'd like to give them every bit of space that we can. And when we roll out the uh, partnership opportunities brochure, which had been kind of put on, on ice because of COVID, um, I would, the mayor and I would reapproach them and uh, see if they had any interest or go searching after other partners. We do have what we think is a very compelling and effective uh, uh, package and offer and template for um, someone to consider, but it's a large ask. And, and um, I think there was um, a mention of, um, you know, building up money um, within Parks and Rec too, where, where what, what is in that line? That is, um, that is actually the yearly capital ask that we ask for in the capital lines. It's kind of, a, uh, kind of along the lines of the Parks Department gang mower where you know, it's really hard to come up with 400,000, right. but a, a little bit easier to chip away at it at 25, 30, 35,000 right. a year and stockpile it over the years. And uh, with any luck, um, we can secure a partnership. And oh, hey, by the way, we've got two hundred thousand to throw at that. So, so that, that's that about would... what's in that. Account. No, no, not that much. Um, I'm gonna. What have we been compiling, Ashley, for a couple of years? I'm just say... gonna find it. <laughs> I, I, we're under a hundred thousand. I, okay. I can imagine okay. currently, but. Um, and then, thank you. Uh -huh. um, and then I uh, took a little float down the Port Neuf recently looking at the banks. And, and I noticed that one of the areas where there's um, m probably more bank erosion than almost anywhere else is um, along the golf course. And um, talking to, to some folks who have more knowledge than I do, um, who were on that float with me, um, it's very closely mowed. Um, and so basically, uh, no natural vegetation, no willows, n nothing, nothing can establish itself. And so the bank is pretty much mud. So I'm wondering um, whether or not you would be open to a conversation about what might maintain the aesthetics that you're after, but could also keep that mud from contributing to the to the from flowing into the river on a you know <laughs> regular basis. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to get out and uh, maybe get a look of exactly where we're talking okay. about. Um, 
you know, the streets department may be involved here with the maintenance of the levees themselves. So it might be at streets, parks, sure. or golf type of discussion, but absolutely we'd be open to discussing that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Councilwoman Stevens, you might remember a few years ago the Army Corps uh, required that we remove all the vegetation and stuff through there. And so only around the golf course? No, up and down the, but, the thing. And, and but the, the river in many places is doing very well. The bank is very stable, but when you get to the golf course, because it's so closely mowed, there's virtually no vegetation, so. That's where the city had a little bit more control than everything else, and so as they were going through, that's probably where they started, and as we argued with the Army Corps to prevent that because the, of the concern of it falling in and stuff. So that's probably what you ran it, what you're seeing is where the vegetation has been removed because Army Corps insisted on that. Remember a few years ago, we had a number of discussions with the Army Corps. We had a, 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 a town hall meeting with the T Army Corps here right. and, and stuff about this. And, and after that meeting and after a number of other discussions that the street department did, we were able to not remove all of the vegetation, but that's prob that would be my guess is well, it's mandated to do so, and so that's, but, where, that's what's happening. But if that were true... Um, no, that is true. It's not well, that, true. Uh, that is true. What you're describing is true. However, if that work were done, you know, a few years ago, and ha isn't done on a regular basis, if that bank isn't essentially scraped, then there would be some kind of vegetation on it. It is clearly washed out. Okay, okay. Um, I, will, I will let you know that is absolutely 100% true that the Army Corps right. did indeed do that, and we were in the middle of those arguments. And so there's no argument whether or not that was true or not. The, the street department, the city of Pocatello was mandated to remove uh, stuff I, and that did indeed happen i understand but what i'm saying mr mayor is that if that work happened several years ago mm -hmm. given the nature of wild reseeding there would be some kind of hint of vegetation okay given three years even one year unless that bank is being routinely scraped in that one portion okay Okay. Any other questions for the golf advisory committee for for golf? Oh, I just want to say thanks to them. They're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you, I'm hearing uh, that the fairways, the greens, and everything are in great shape, and so thank you for what you're doing. That's that's really keeping our asset. Uh, uh, viable and nice, so thank you. Mr. Mayor, one thing. I was approached by a citizen who represents a group of golfers who are concerned about the dead trees. Okay. They would like to work with Fort Golf and the city to maybe jump in and help remove some of those large dead trees. I know that um, Brett has earmarked some of those trees for removal. Um, in the past, we've had an agreement with the Parks Department in that our capital fund would rent a, uh, a man lift. I would provide the labor and the, the trimming of the trees, and then Brett and his staff would clean up at the, at the end of the season. But I think it's proved to be quite a bit of work for Brett and staff, particularly where they're kind of limited, where it's kind of a seasonal employment. So if we were going to look at using some of the capital fund to hire out and, and bid out and see what it would cost us to have some of these other tree service companies come in and remove. Well, this was the men's association so they would like to volunteer to help with that effort yeah maybe let, let us see where we're at with that I, I would be i guess my concern i wouldn't want anybody to get injured um, with cutting down trees and that and some of those guys are probably very knowledgeable in, in trimming trees and stuff like that and i have had when i was trimming the last time at riverside there was a number of folks that they wanted the firewood so they were they were really good about talking with me first staying out of my way so that they didn't get injured, but they were just cleaning up the wood and taking it home from the firewood. Roger. It, um, volunteers using chainsaws yeah. is the only OSHA regulated volunteer thing that I know of. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, because it's so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have a friend that does it 
a big volunteer group who goes after tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff. They have to all go through an OSHA certification to do that, even though they're volunteers. So I understand the volunteer wishes, but it's one of those deals that might be a liability unless we train them. I, I can provide a little bit more information on that, Councilman Cheatham. Um, so we, um, you know, based on some of the input provided by, by the residents, we did uh, engage top-notch tree service and we have a, uh, a quote for uh, just under $10,000 to do some fairly substantial tree removals. Um, we're also uh, entertaining maybe uh, um, using a little bit more of the golf CIP money to do some more removals over to Riverside as well. Um, we, we do feel the need to contract this out. Uh, the Parks Department staff uh, has their hands full out in the park system, so it's hard to kind of divert those resources if uh, kind of raw Peter to pay Paul. So we do feel like we need to contract it out because of resources. Um, the issue then becomes trying to uh, keep the courses open as long as possible to generate revenue and then have an available course to do kind of that major work with heavy equipment and everything. So we're, we're working with four golf on that. That is in the works though. Super, any other questions? Thank you very much for everything yeah. you're doing. We Thank appreciate you. that. We have just a little oh. more, Mr. Mayor. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and just a brief comment on Councilman Stevens' question, uh, the river borders Riverside, my estimate's about a mile, and all of it is raised up, so there's a buffer between the golf course and the river, and so there's very limited runoff coming from the golf course. Um, almost zero. It's substantially raised. So I think that problem probably exists from the earlier tree, tree or removal of, of trees and shrubs. Uh, just a, a few more brief comments. Uh, future golf course needs committee members are aware that the city continues to face budget challenges with many competing needs and services. There are requests for funding year of fiscal 21 for the golf CIP fund budget in the amount of $30,000 for continued golf course and clubhouse renovations and improvements and funding in the amount of $30,000 to continue savings and accumulating resources for replacements of the Riverside Clubhouse, which is the most pressing current need at the golf courses. Actually, both clubhouses need to be replaced, but a lot of money and future plans. Um, other course needs, uh, for the council to keep in mind the irrigation infrastructure at Highland and Riverside. Uh, at Riverside uh, has been in place since 1987 and the early 90s at Highland. Um, concessionaire and city, city are managing the breakage and water wear issues and the systems are performing well for their age. However, due to irrigation system life expectancy, Estimates of approximately 30 years for Greg Bear of the Land Group uh, in analysis done in 2011. The city should probably begin to make plans for these long term replacements. <clears throat> At the beginning of uh, our presentation, the council has provided a table that summarizes revenues and expenditures uh, in the golf course fund over the past five fiscal years. As you can see from the table, Golf and Pocatello has contributed $513,000 to the recreation fund during that period. Um, and that's above expenditures. <clears throat> Revenue from these city assets is both put back into the courses and also helps to fund other city recreation services. Some additional benefits economically of the golf courses or dollars spent by golfers from out of town are critical since they bring in money that would otherwise not be spent in the local economy. Uh, often out of town, golfers will expend dollars not only at the courses themselves, but on restaurants and other retail items, on gas uh, while they're in town. Uh, golf courses help attract higher spending groups of the local community. Another valuable area where golf courses assist community is increased property values 
honor near golf courses where home buyers value value the open space and views a natural beauty when making home buying decisions. These factors causing golf course properties to tend to appreciate at a higher rate than some others. Golf courses can also help attract other businesses to the community. As stated earlier, the Golf Advisory Committee considers the golf courses a significant asset to the city and believe that they provide quality recreation and have very positive economic impact on our overall parks and rec department operations. In conclusion, on behalf of myself and the committee members, I would again like to thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members for your support of golf in Pocatello. We have two excellent golf courses and golf concessionaire and city staff who care deeply about the courses and the golfers who use them. Are there any questions? Chris. Um, yes. So um, since clearly the, the golf courses create, give or take, about $100,000 a year revenue, correct? Um, I, I, am I, I mean, I, that's, that's I mean, at, at about 100,000 100, into 000, the, right. Well, it's, it's um, probably higher than that. Okay. Uh, it's uh, depending on the year. Um, we, we did two seasons ago go to a market-based system where it rise, the revenues rise and fall with what the right. market bears. And the concessionaire doesn't go out of business. Um, there's also uh, non-resident fees and CIP fee pass-throughs right. that are on top of that. Right. And then there's water department uh, revenues that are also generated in the neighborhood of 100,000. So I would say citywide, we're probably more in the 225 to 250 range per year of revenues generated. So my question is, given the fact that golf courses can be, especially since they, there hasn't been clubhouse uh, renovation for a significant amount of time, and it sounds like the irrigation systems at both courses, um, you know, need to be replacement or significant repair needs to be planned for. Um, do we have a plan where part of the revenue that the golf course generates automatically flows into a fund for maintenance and so forth? Do we do we have a you know a long range plan that includes kind of a, a calendared estimate of when various needs arise and then do we have a capital set aside from the revenue generated that matches those anticipated needs? Yeah, the, um, the stipulation in the golf agreement was that the CIP pass-through fees are designed for that specific purpose where they're uh, kind of collected each year and then earmarked for eventual large capital projects. Um, I was also happy to see that, that Ashley, uh, up until, Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, a year or two ago, um, the unused capital funds used to re uh, revert to the recreation fund, whereas now they're earmarked in a capital account also for these purposes. So um, that's, that's kind of the, um, the stockpile and the plan to, to address some of these larger issues in the future. Because I'm, I'm just wondering if, if about a minimum of $500,000 profit, so to speak, was generated over the past five years, why is there less than 100,000 in the fund for clubhouse renovation? I mean, that, that seems to say to me, and, I, and this isn't a criticism of anyone, but it just seems to say to me that we, we don't have some kind of formulaic set aside for these large projects. Well, the, the 100,000 figure, that was a, a reflection of um, instead of going into the rec fund, the capital money being diverted to the capital fund the last couple of years, and that's probably a little high on that estimate. But I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, Ashley and I uh, going back. I mean, it's it, in our budget sheets, it's very clear what the capital money is, and we can come up with that figure, but uh, it just... Well, and I'm not concerned about that. I'm just concerned about having some sort of a formulaic set aside since you're creating um, 
a, a profit for the city. I, I'm concerned about having some sort of formulaic set aside so that your needs um, it can be met when the, when it becomes apparent that that you know that sure. now is the time. Something that I've heard from the golf community over and over and over is we fund all of the parks and rec department, which is certainly not true. But that that money that you're seeing there that goes into the park and rec fund. Uh, only a portion of it actually is is a part of the CIP that comes back to the golf courses. Um, if it were all going back to the golf courses in 10 years, we could build a new clubhouse. Right. But that that isn't how it works or how it has ever worked. Right. So, so, so Roger has a... On your uh, spreadsheet here, you show expenditures. First of all, revenues run from about 150 to 174,000. But and that, then, is, that is not including water bill revenues. Yeah, okay. But then out of those revenues, you have some operating cost expenditures, which I believe would be the clubhouse and some of the capital outlays we have. Correct. And the bottom line is probably, in my estimation, what goes into the general parks program. Is that, is that accurate? Now, it's a, up until a couple of years ago, it all used to go into the recreation fund. Now it's, it's kind of a split type of situation. But, okay, there, but um, th that is the intent of that capital money, is to stockpile it for large capital expenses. Um, but they are costly, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an incremental process. And so what percentage or roughly how much so that's been in place for a year? Yeah, I want to say a year or two. I think it's been since 2016 when we set up the reserve policy. We also set up the capital policy okay. to transfer any additional capital into um, capital contingency. So, so roughly what percentage of, of um, I don't want to call any revenue excess, but anyway, um, of excess revenue or, or how is it figured, how much goes into golf so that, again, so that we know that we've got some kind of a plan. Sure. So it's and only unused capital, that's it. Unused capital that was budgeted for. It does not, it's not based on revenue, it's based on unused capital. That's what's transferred. So some years we would use some of that capital for major cart path improvement, improvements or HVAC or repaintings and floorings or things like that. Um, I, I just don't have, I, right. I just didn't go to that depth to prepare for that, right. but we certainly can't. Well, I, I just thought I heard you say that there was a split so that money was being set aside. And I guess I'm trying to understand that. And it sounds like there isn't money being set aside out of the revenue generated, and there is money being set aside. And I just want to understand I yeah, just want to understand. Yeah. I can also, you know, spend some time with you on, on sure. offline and show, and kind of walk you through the sure. contract. And, and Ashley and right. I, I can get with her and we can, you know, quantify those right. figures a little bit better. I just, I'm sorry, I'm just not prepared. No, no, that's that that's what. But I, I think Larry's observation that if we were investing back in golf, what we're receiving from golf, we could build a clubhouse. Right. You know, I mean that. That's the bottom line here is that we have. A, an activity that the city sponsors that more than pays for itself right. in other city activities. And so if we were really to limit this to golf and golf paying for golf, we could probably build a clubhouse in 10 years have it paid for. We, we, would, have, we would have enough capital build up in four or five years to go ahead and finance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's me, that, that's where I would like to see us get so that rather than suddenly having the roof cave in or whatever, have to come up with a million um, and then we have you know a huge necessary expense in one year. I I believe that just like with with fleet rollover and you know all these large kinds of expenditures, I believe that they can be calendared and there can be a revenue process that that where the people who are paying for golf 
actually also then reap the benefits, so to speak, um, and the taxpayers in general are not suddenly required um, to fund a golf, whether they play golf or not. I mean, this to me looks like a rare opportunity for the people who play to fund the amenity that they use. And I guess I'm curious why we're not doing that. I, I'm not expecting an answer. I yeah, just I, I think we are doing that. We just we we don't. Ashley and I would need to quantify exactly where we're at in, in the process. One of the, one of the things that that this revenue, uh, par a portion of it goes back into the parks department, who who participate in golf course of maintenance course. and renovation. Right. They they do a lot at the golf courses. Right. So. I don't think every penny of that is necessarily reroutable, but uh, certainly a portion of it, and it would certainly make the golfers happy. Uh, the first question when we first started talking about replacing the clubhouse was, how many taxpayers play golf? Well, I wasn't quick enough on my feet. If I had been, I'd have said every golfer pays taxes. Right. So we all we pay taxes, and we also pay right into the golf courses Heidi yeah I just had a quick comment I um, I've been out and I've seen you know the golf um, clubhouse that we're talking about and stuff like that these guys are not letting it get to the point where no, suddenly one day right the roof is going to cave in and it's like in total disrepair they're doing a very good job with the resources that they have um, so I just wanted to point that out and I guess kind of to Larry's point also a lot of those funds are being utilized elsewhere in the parks department so maybe we need to you know if there are budget concerns please realize that if you take a hundred percent of that and put it towards future then you're gonna ha you're gonna have a budget issue somewhere else and I know budget money is a very big concern so if we don't want to have to start taking more tax in parks and rec I'm just mentioning that's a consideration well, yes, obviously, and I, I don't believe I mentioned a percentage. Uh, I, I just am talking, frankly, about a plan. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually am pretty, even though I'm not a golfer, I'm very aware of the golf course because I, I literally, every time I go anywhere or come home from anywhere, literally I drive right by Riverside. So, so I, I mean, the course looks great. You know, I know you're doing a good job. That's not my concern. My concern is actually trying to get some of these periodic large expenditures um, calendared out and get a revenue process to pay for them attached to that calendar. So that, because right now it feels a bit like, you know, we're, we're kind of waiting for, you know, a potential major expense. And I, I don't think we need to end up in that situation with a little planning and forethought. So I think what's important is get, get with Ashley, get with uh, Councilwoman Stevens and uh, explain to her what that formula is and, uh, and what we have and what that money's been used for in the past. and and all of that stuff. And so, because she's right, it'd be nice to be able to have an idea of when we can build a new and what we can do there. And so, I think that's the that's the key right there. And that's all you're asking for. So let's yep. get that done and we'll go from there. And just one more brief comment. Uh, Riverside probably won't fall down, the clubhouse won't fall down tomorrow, but that building is over 100 years old. Right. It was moved onto that spot is settling we have plumbing issues electrical issues so it it is it is reached its life expectancy <laughs> absolutely okay thank, thank you very you. much thank, thank you for what you're doing thank you we will move to agenda item number three is parks and recreation advisory committee update representatives from the parks and recreation advisory committee will discuss the committee's goals and projects as well as council's policies and expectations Mayor and Council, I'd like to introduce uh, Fred Belzer. He's our uh, chairman of the Parks and Recreation Advi Advisory Board, and he'll be uh, walking us through the presentation. Fred? Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank the Mayor and the Council for this opportunity to present the uh, Parks and Rec Board uh, 
advisory board annual report. Our board members, uh, we have Vice Chairman uh, Dave Dornan, Kay Corbridge, Rachel LeVay, Ali Gorney, uh, Judy Taylor and Doug Milder who are here today. Uh, we have newly appointed member Tanya Wilkes, uh, Darren Black, Dave Pacioretty, and outgoing long-term board member Bart Reed. Uh, we'd also like to sp uh, sp express some special thanks to council members Heidi Adamson and Claudia Ortega for their involvement and support of the board as board liaisons uh, for the past year. Uh, just some general information. We meet six times a year in February, April, June, August, and October, and December. Uh, the meetings were typically held at the Community Recreation Center in a fairly small conference room there because of the COVID situation. The last several meetings have been held here. Uh, the normal meeting time is at noon, and we push that back to 11 a.m. We also accommodate board members who, for whatever reason, are not able to attend in person, and we have a, a phone hookup for them to attend. Uh, the um, meeting attendance has been excellent, and uh, very few absences, and the board members all participate, provide valuable input to the, to the staff. Uh, we have key projects and issues that the board has been involved in. Uh, since our last annual presentation to the council last year. Uh, for council members who were here last year and the mayor was here, the draft Ross Park master plan was a major part of the presentation last year. Uh, since then, the board has worked with staff and local landscape architect Jackson Land Design. Uh, we've served as a steering committee for developing and fine tuning recommendations for the plan based on extensive input we've solicited from community members and stakeholders. And as you might recall, the draft uh, plan was presented to council at, a work, at the work session meeting in November, where council was supportive of the draft plan. Uh, the COVID situation, unfortunately, has caused some major reshuffling of priorities and delayed some aspects of the master plan process a bit. However, staff is in the process of formalizing the offer from FA engineers to make needed private land adjacent to Lower Ross Park available for the council preferred, preferred upper to Lower Ross Park connector road, which would provide park access from 5th and 4th avenues. Uh, staff is also working with city engineering staff and Jackson Land Design to quantify the small slice of privately owned land needed to bring connectivity from 5th and 4th Avenues to Upper uh, Ross Park uh, to fruition. Uh, following these last steps, a final plan rendering will be presented to council uh, for council direction and brought forward at an appropriate regular city council meeting uh, for a public hearing and potential adoption consideration. Uh, the board has also participated in the Portneuf River visioning process and proposed Centennial Rainy Park improvement plans with Hannah Sanger and the Science and Environment Department uh, providing those opportunities, as well as we consider uh, city golf course operations and issues as they arise. Um, we also have reviewed a Parks and Recreation Department reopening plan after the COVID situation for operational measures to address uh, ongoing COVID concerns. Uh, we receive quarterly and annual parks and rec uh, department budget reports for review and input. At each meeting, the board is also kept well informed of all programs, services, and activities of the parks and rec department and has provided to the community for the uh, two previous months through comprehensive director's reports, which continue to indicate reasonable levels of participation in city programs and services provided by Parks and Recreation, even through the current COVID challenges. And lastly, one other significant effort that the board has been heavily involved with in the past year is the development of a partnership, partnership opportunities brochure 
with the goal of identifying needed park system capital projects and improvements, uh, developing the brochure and the program, which will outline the details of each project, including facility and amenity characteristics, facts and figures, partnership benefits and returns on investment and other concerns. And then the marketing of these opportunities to local businesses and individuals, seeking partnerships and donations to accomplish significant park system improvements in return for naming rights and other meaningful benefits. That process began in August of 2019 and in early 2020, but also was put on hold to some extent by the COVID challenges. The staff and the board plan to continue the process in the fall and winter for a spring-summer 2021 rollout when economic conditions are more favorable. Uh, we feel that some good momentum has been attained with the successful Connections Credit Union Partnership for Zoo Idaho and will serve as a good precedent for other opportunities. As far as board priorities for the upcoming year, we will continue to work with the Parks and Rec Department staff to maintain and increase levels of program and service participation and satisfaction, as well as implementing new program opportunities and revenue sources within the existing park system and staffing structure. We will continue to work with staff to monitor budget expenditures and revenues with the goal of positive fund balances in all divisions. We will work with staff to finalize development of the partnership opportunities brochure and assist in marketing these opportunities to local businesses to partner with the city to help fund major park system improvements. Finally, we'd like to thank the city council uh, on behalf of Parks and Recreation Board and staff. We'd like to thank you, Mayor Blad, and the council members for your continued strong support for the Parks and Recreation Department. We're very appreciative of the Council's continued commitments that have allowed Parks and Recreation to accomplish what it has this past year in providing these valuable services and programs to the community. Uh, the Advisory Board and staff will continue to work together closely to provide outstanding Parks and Recreation programs and services. And as our department branding indicates, strive to, uh, to help Pocatello play often and live better. And we invite questions from the mayor and, and the council. Questions, council? I would just like to say thank you for having such an organized um, approach to this very, to the Ross Park um, large project. Um, I really appreciate that and um, also, I want to thank you for kind of um, providing a template and an example of how we can partner with individuals and organizations in the community. Um, I think that's those kinds of partnerships are evident in virtually all highly successful communities. And um, I want to thank you all, the advisory committee, staff, John, um, for, for really pursuing that um, so clearly and effectively. Thank you. Any others? Parks look great. Thank you very so, much. So question, oh. how would you operate if we took all the golf money away from you? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to let John take that one. <laughs> Maybe that's more a comment than a question. <laughs> Not near as well. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks for everything Thank you, you do with the Appreciate Golf Advisory it. Board. Appreciate it. We'll move to agenda item number four is a fire union quarterly update. Members of the Pocatello Fire Union will give uh, the council an update of their activities at, for the past quarter. Mayor and Council, um, Andy Moldenhauer, President of Pocatello Firefighters Local 187. Um, it's good to see your smiling faces again, <laughs> or, at least, or at least to see you guys in person. Twinkling um, eyes, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, 
I just want to start off by thanking you guys for your willingness to, to work with us to get our contract extended. Um, this year, of course, we, we just voted to, or we just, both sides agreed to extend the contract one year, um, which, which enabled us to be able to get through negotiations without a, pro a prolonged process where social distancing would have been difficult. Um, obviously, the current pandemic's impacted the way that we do business. Um, our business is public health and emergency response. Um, and so I just uh, wanted to let you guys know that we've been creative and flexible with the department in looking at our response models and trying to make sure that we limit exposures to our membership and um, maintain our response capability. Um, most, most of the, the regular external activities that we do have really been put on hold. Um, I think last time that we, that we spoke with you guys, we had some people that were just about to go to the Seattle stair climb, which as you know, raises money for leukemia and lymphoma. And they'd already gotten through the fundraising portion of that, but they were headed to the event. Um, the event ended up being canceled. I think the, the first death in the country was in King County shortly before that event was scheduled to happen. Um, so what our membership did and what, what the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society decided to do was to hold a virtual event. And our team went and covered the, the equivalent of 69 stories like they would in the Columbia Tower in Holt Arena. And um, you know, they socially distanced, they still wore the gear, but they each got their own stair lane and, and went up 69 stories. The money that we'd raised, of course, went into the went to the foundation. Um, upcoming, we've got fill the boot, which we won't be able to be doing, you know, collecting money in person in intersections. So we will be working on a on a virtual campaign and trying to raise money online. Um, I think that that's one of the one of the biggest benefits to the way that we've collected money in the past is that a lot of people just dump out the ashtray that's in their car. And that's where a lot of the, the funds that we get come from, where doing it virtually, you know, makes it to where people have to take it out of their accounts. And I, I expect that the numbers will be down, but hopefully we can get good community support. Um, we've also got, we, we generally do coats for kids, but with everything the way that it is with schools right now, um, not positive how much need there's gonna be, but also not positive um, whether or not in-person teaching will happen. So um, the Jason Whitcomb, who, who usually heads that up for us, has been working on fundraisers and trying to make sure that we've, that we've got money in the bank to be able to do that if we're able to do that. Um, but otherwise, we're just, we're just waiting and hoping that we can get past this and, and move forward. Um, I don't have a whole lot because what we're normally doing is, is not happening right now. So. Uh, do you guys have any questions? So I, do, I have a couple of real quick ones. The, um, the fill the boot, yes, when, sir. what's the, your time frame that you typically do that? And I think you might see more because people are dumping change and instead of pulling out their credit card and putting an extra 20 bucks in. So you might, you might see more. You know, I, I'm sorry, but I can't give you a date on that. I was talking with our coordinator about it last night and and the MDA has been after him to get to get things going, and and he actually um, was a little bit leaning towards trying to cancel it this year, and I don't think that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I expressed that opinion to him last night, and what we will do is um, when we when we start that campaign, we'll share it on our union Facebook, and we'll try to make sure that we broadcast that, and I'll I'll inform you. Okay, that sounds great. If you can do that, then my second question was. The coats for kids, it, it, we recognize that is up in the air. What is your like drop dead date that you have to order those coats in? And because uh, I know you would bring in three or four hundred coats a year, so you know, um, I'm, I'm not positive. I wish I would have spoken with Jason, who who handles that. Um, I do know that there is a certain amount of time frame that that is involved in that. Um, it's it, it's kind of interesting because that. That program has evolved over the years. When we started it, um, the, the, we were able to get coats manufactured in the country. And that was a really big deal for us because the, the coats that we were providing actually opened up a, a, a manufacturing plant in the state. 
and and that provides jobs for for this country. Um, ultimately, that the, that business took off, and they started doing really well, and they didn't have time to make our, make our coats. <laughs> and so forgot so, where they came from. As well. Yeah, exactly. They forgot where they came from, but. Um, but anyway, uh, we've, we've ended up having to go to different sources to get our coats, and the majority of them have been coming out of China. And so, obviously, that impacts our ability to get them in a timely manner. Um, typically, uh, I, I would say that, it, that, it, that we can get coats within, you know, within two to three weeks. And, and so, depending on how things go, um, we, we should be able to get them in a timely manner. So, Thank I do know that he puts together a kind of a standard order because there there is a lot of coats that, that that we end up giving out, and and the coats are somewhat generic. I mean, they've got they've got different colors and stuff like that, but we order them order them in sizes and colors, and so um, he can he he has the ability to look at some of the past stuff that we've done and and do a somewhat standard order. Great. I just wanted to thank you all for trying to come up with creative ways to keep some of these fundraisers going and keep helping the community in the way that you do. I know it's challenging when you can't do the way that you've always done it, but um, to try to do some things virtually and, and keep helping people is wonderful. So thank you for that. You, you know, one thing in that regard that, that's kind of funny is uh, Jordan Peterson, who is one of our team captains and has been to the Seattle stair climb multiple times, um, every time that he goes, he has he has a teardrop that's put on him, that's tattooed on him to signify going to that event. Um, this year, he actually had that digitized. So, it, so it, because it was rather than being a looking like a standard teardrop, it's pixelated because to sim to signify the fact that it was virtual this year. <laughs> which was kind of funny. So. Chris? Yeah, this isn't a, a question. It's um, I really appreciate hearing about all the union activities that you do that benefit the community. Um, what I, and, and being new, we may have, uh, Mr. Mayor, other opportunities where we can actually um, hear from boots on the ground, you know, about um, concerns and issues and so forth and so on. Um, these, this form doesn't typically, um, wasn't created for that, but you know, we have some interaction with the chief, especially during budgeting, but um, is there anything um, that you would like us as a council to know from your membership? that might help us be thoughtful and informed um, in the future? Um, you know, the, the way that we used to hold these meetings prior to the past year or so is that we used to just, we used to just meet when you guys were preparing for council meeting. Um, and, and it was immediately before, before the council meeting on whatever the quarter ends up being. Um, that for me was a little bit better just because it was a little more informal. I mean, the public was still available to be there because it was still an open meeting. Um, however, it was it's a little nerve wracking to get up here in front of the bright lights. You know, you guys, you, I, you guys, uh, you guys are used to it and I guess you signed on for it. And I guess to a degree I did too. Um, that to me was a little bit more informal and, and it would be great if we could trend that direction. However, um, can I clarify, please? That that they used to meet in executive session, and the legislature took that option away. That we are no longer able to meet in that way. So, in a public meeting like this, we certainly that's where it has to meet. We sure. no longer can meet in executive session the way you, you used to, the way you're okay. remembering, and the public were not allowed in there. Okay. Because it was executive session, right. and that's where you were able to share that. But the legislature decided they didn't want that done anymore. Has to be in a public forum like this, so that's why we have to meet this way. Great, and and Fair I enough. yeah, and and but 
I, I would, and I understand that, that negotiations have to be separate and have their No, own. it wasn't even negotiations. It was what you just said. Right. They just gave us an update and their concerns with the fire union. Right. That's where that was said. That had nothing to do with negotiations. Right, right, right. So I, I was just commenting that I understand that, that they need to be separated. That was my only point. But I would really welcome an opportunity to whether it you know has to be under the bright lights or not, um, I would welcome an opportunity where we can actually have more of a conversation because I believe that relationship is built through authentic conversation and I believe that it's very important for the, the council and boots on the ground in both police and fire to have um, a relationship and, and a connection and to have opportunities to build that. So that would be a request um, to do it as part of these, these updates or, but I would like to see it on a quarterly basis where we actually have an opportunity more informally, even though it has to be in this formalized setting to have conversation. So I'm requesting that that somehow be worked into annual agendas. So that's exactly what this is for. No, but it was shut no. down at one meeting when the police went into right. some deliberation. Well, well, this is a union update, not a police department or a fire department thing. That, those no, no, are they, two they started going things. into the police union stuff and it was shut down. No, right. that was they were going into police department activities and police department policies and things like that that's what was shut down the union this is formatted for the union to be able to come in and absolutely do what you're asking to do okay that's so then and so so in the past the entire e-board has been here at times sometimes it's just andy sometimes it's sure. two or three of them but and that's the same with police that's what this this is for that very format right and I, if I'm recalling, although it was early in my tenure, uh, the police officer who was speaking actually was talking about um, additional stress and strain and, and uh, post-traumatic syndrome. And he was shut down and told that that was not the purpose of this meeting. This meeting was to hear about Okay, I would encourage you to go back and look at that and see what that really truly but, was because that was that was them talking about about negotiations and police department things, not police oh, union no, stuff. Well, so. regardless, regardless, now that we know that you can um, approach these perhaps in a different way, I would be very interested in um, having these also serve as an opportunity where we could hear about what's important to boots on the ground uh, in the fire department. And do these updates occur how many times? Quarterly. Any? Quarterly. Quarterly. Great. Yeah, may I get clarification? Are you allowing discussion regarding their pay? And wouldn't that, that be was, negotiation? That, that, is, that is negotiation. Uh, that is, I that think is, we need our Jared in here to clarify because we're right. walking a very fine line. So before we that look ahead and say, hey, let's talk about these things, I really encourage us since our attorney is not here. Well, I want to I want to go that. on the record. It's really hard to negotiate when negotiations haven't been opened, and we're able to hear personnel issues regarding how negotiations have hit the union. You want me to go see Jared's available, sir? Jared is sick today. He's not able to. But I I want to go on the record okay. when for Jared to interpret that. Okay, Jared can interpret that, but remember, negotiations are open to the public. They are televised, no, no. they are But I'm all saying those that, that we're not negotiating, we're just hearing from them the results of what things are happening in their union, yeah. within the structure of their organization. And I have no problem hearing that because we're not in a period of negotiation right now. Okay. We'll have Jared make the interpretation yet again. Thank the interpretation you. that he has made his, his follower following that interpretation, but we can ask him yet again if that's what the council would like. Well, so we, we can definitely do that. That's no big deal. 
perhaps he could just do a bulleted list of, of what kinds of topics are allowable yeah, uh, rather than just okay. a sentence or two that remains sure. open to interpretation. Sure. Anyway, Sounds thank good. you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to provide whatever information the council is legally able to receive and whatever you guys would like to know. Um, I do try to, to reach out to my membership, although this meeting was a little bit, um, the way that you guys have had to hold your meetings, um, this, this meeting snuck up on me because I, I, I wasn't positive whether it was gonna happen and I'm, and, and I'm not positive whether it was scheduled on this date originally. Um, however, I, I can try to provide whatever information and try to reach them with my membership and see um, whatever concerns they have. And, and certainly I don't want to go down the road of, of turning this into negotiations. Right. I'm just here to provide you guys with information and to let you know what we're doing. So Perfect. That's what you've been asked to be able to do. So perfect. Any other questions, comments? Sounds great. Andy, thank you so much. Thank you for what you do for the, the city and for the union and everything. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. So if Jared's not here, nobody else from legal can be present so that we, if we have a legal question, we have an attorney to answer. I mean, there's, there's, there's four attorneys in the city attorney's so, office, right? So there are. Right. And, and uh, you've got them in the pre-trials. I mean, there's probably somebody that we can grab if we need to, but I know that they're in the middle of a pile of stuff that they're they're doing as well. So they may so not sure always be available. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Thing. So we're before we move into agenda item number five, let's take a break for a few minutes so that Ashley can get everything set up, and then we will go from there. We'll go ahead and get going. Thank you very much for joining us after our break. We'll, we'll move to agenda item number five is fiscal year 2021 budget discussion. Finance department staff will review public comments and council discuss, dis, discussion from the August 6, 2020 budget hearing. Uh, Ashley, uh, but before we, before we, Ashley, Roger wants to go ahead and say a few words here. Yeah, um, I've, I've scanned this and I don't agree with this being where we ended up. Okay. I, um, this is an answer to a, a problem that we haven't addressed all the answers. And I think there are multiple answers that we can look to. Just to give a little context, I have uh, eight different people that I've talked to with regard to taxes. Uh, one person, has gone from 82,613 in taxable value to 104,685 for this year, going to 111,383 next year. The taxes are going up by 53% over two years. The uh, taxes for another family went from in projected on what their uh, values are if we go straight 2%. They were 33.84.52 this year. They will go to 41.21.02 next year. Another family, 2018.25 this year, 25.03.42. That's just playing 2% with us staying at 1%. Another family, 35.83.56. They will go to 48.07.42 next year with the valuation. Another family, 2779.18 this year, they will go to $4,667 next year. Another family, 667.20 this year, they will go to 77.54.22. We set up that we were going to attack the issue of increasing taxes. We, were, we set up that we were going to reduce our taxes by $1,049,000. That's what we left here believing that day. We have not done a service to our taxpayers with what we are proposing. We have to understand that if you look at the first category on the, uh, well, one of the first categories where it compares $100,000, that is only one side of the picture. One family that I know came in 
in 2018 at $100,000 evaluation, taxable valuation. This year they are at $160,000 of evaluation. Next year they will go to $190,000 of taxable valuation. Do you understand we have raised their taxes over a two year period 90%? And we have to assess, you can't blame it on anybody else because we're at least one half of the formula. This city is one half of the formula. The county and the school district make up about 25% each. We make up 50, from 50 to 53% we have ranged. So we are part of the solution to runaway taxes. And I know people that are moving out of town because they don't see us tackling this issue. We have people moving into town, but there are people moving out of town too. We've had some people tell us that they've had businesses that wouldn't, really look, wouldn't locate here. So to me, the first issue we need to decide is that are we gonna cut back to where we said we were gonna come in in our last meeting. Therefore, I move that we reduce our tax burden by $1,049,000. Forty-nine Second. or forty-six? It was one forty-nine. Is what we reported. I have it right here. <laughs> was one million forty-nine thousand one hundred and thirty-four okay. dollars? That was the gap. That was not the reduction to taxes. That was the That's gap. That's what the motion that Heidi made says. With this gap, I will move that we publish this. That's what her motion was. She right. stated that as premier. Right, as the uh, gap, and it, it, that was the gap. Okay, and I'm saying that that is on the, the basis from which all of our decisions were made was forming that gap. Okay. And, and that, that differential. That's what I was going to explain. And, and so yeah. I, I move that we work to reduce our tax burden by $1,041,000. I'll round it off. Second. May I request that we receive Ashley's presentation mm -hmm. so we have all of the information before we start into? Well, we have a motion on the floor. Let's go ahead and vote on the motion. And and if the motion fails, we'll receive all of her information. And after that information is given, we can re-entertain everything that's there. I think it's interesting to have a motion quickly like this, but we can do that. And it we'll frames see. the context, and we are we'll controlling where the goes. discussion. With that, right. Ruth, we have a motion on the floor, a motion by Bray, second by Ortega. Would you please call the roll? Just wrong, sir. I wasn't quite prepared for that. Sorry, Councilmember. Typically, we wait until afterwards, but he's got the motion on the floor, so well, this we'll is that. I want to frame the discussion, and that's that. that's all I am trying to do is say, that let's go back to where we were last Thank time, you. frame Thank the discussion. You. Okay. Bray? Yes. Ortega? Yes. Adamson? I would like to hear what Ashley has to present to us so we have all of the information before we making a decision. So at this time, no, not because I'm opposed to the, the idea, but I'm just want to get all the information. Okay, Laura? Uh, I'm a no also. We need to get, hear the information first. Gina? No. Stevens? Yes. Vlad? I'm a, I'm a no with that information. That's a horrible way to make decisions on a, on a budget <laughs> like this. And so we need the information from Ashley today so that we can go ahead and then turn this into an actual discussion so we can have, Mayor, a, have that. Mayor, it's done. not a Thank horrible you. way. We're setting parameters. Thank you very much. Discussion. We'll go ahead and listen to a, a presentation. Thank you. Okay. Ashley. Ashley Walsh, Chief Financial Officer. I'm going to review the July 9th tax solution because there's a lot of confusion regarding that. We're going to go through the budget and publication and review of the current tax solution. So here's your $1,041,134 gap, which is not equivalent to a property tax reduction. I obviously need to fix this form for next year because there's a lot of confusion regarding the gap. What we took to create this gap was estimated new construction, which is an increase of property tax of $598,432. We estimated a reduction to property taxes of $442,702.
which was done by reductions and also additional revenues. The estimated tax effect when we left on July 9th was a $155,730 increase to taxes for fiscal year 21. That is what we left here on July 9th. There may have been confusion on that. It showed that the gap was $1,041,134. This is how we got there. So, so where is that on here, Ashley? That top number, the gap? No, that, where is where is the $155,730 increase? It's not on there. Um, you do have your $1,041,000 is composed of those two items, the estimated new construction, the estimated reduction to taxes. That's where you get your $1,041,134. If you take your estimated new construction minus your estimated reductions, you get a $155,730 increases to taxes for fiscal year 21. So Ashley, I have a question. Um, we reduced most of our revenue sources that are non-tax, right? Correct. Because we saw the effect that this is projected to have on our people in other places where revenue is produced. But we are saying right now as a council, we need to increase our taxes to our people by $155,730. Yes, and it was due to new construction. Yes. And, and it was, sorry, could you just so, repeat that? Again? So council, remember, new due to new construction. New construction we estimated, and it was an estimate of $20 million. Right. The county has given us the numbers of $15 million, and so you're seeing the reduction right. there. We did not have those numbers on July 9th. Do we, we have the numbers there. now? Yes, and I have those on the slide. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear that when I made the motion last time, I mean, I don't know if it's because I've been through the budget previously or, or what, but I was very aware that new construction was not factored into that. So I understand how it can be kind of confusing mm -hmm. and I think maybe people thought that I thought we were overall reducing, but even in the state program, they're just talking about the amount you levied last year, don't levy more than that, new construction was excluded from that yes. rule. So I always knew that that was excluded from that and I always knew that it was excluded from the gap on Ashley's spreadsheet so i just want to be you know yeah clear about that i was i was not making that motion thinking that that was with the new construction factored in because new construction should in theory the added revenue coming from those properties is going to pay for the extra <coughs> street maintenance and the extra you know policing of subdivisions that are new and those types of things and so that's where or in other cities it's reduced their levy rate right. if you would go back and look historically at many cities in idaho their growth has continued to reduce their levy rates we have not attacked the issue of levy rates like we should here other cities have done it if, a few years ago you know go back to when the uh, uh, recession hit and everything there were cities that went way high, but they have con conversely gone down low compared to us. And that's because they relied on the new construction revenue to more than offset their expenses. And they, they were able to reduce their levies. They don't use the rising tide of evaluation as a windfall for revenue. Right. But, but there are some cities that have done that, but there are also cities in Idaho that have taken an inordinance mm -hmm. that they will take 3% every year regardless of what happens. Plus their new construction. Plus their new construction. And so, I mean, it's all over the board. We can pick and choose what cities are doing what, but by ordinance, there are cities that take the 3% automatically across the board. Could you name the and cities? So Boise. Meridian. But it, it remains, um, when I looked at the most recent um, levy rates in Idaho, and I looked at cities that are roughly, give or take, of our size, I believe we are the fifth highest now there are some small cities like um, Nez Perce and so forth and so on. Um, and I looked at our ag land um, 
for the county, not six, mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, I looked at our ag land um, in proportion to urban, and that wasn't different enough to explain it to me. So, so regardless, regardless, I believe that we have a tax burden issue that is impeding our economic growth mm -hmm. and it is overburdening our taxpayers. And I do not believe that we have historically as a city addressed this issue adequately. So, so, so before we get too far down this road, I really think we need to finish this and listen to the presentation, find out where we are. But I do want to just mention one thing in regards to that comment. Historically, Bannock County has, ha has held values of homes low. We can speculate why they've done that, and I don't know why they've done that. But historically, and that's factual, they have held values of homes down, opposed to increasing those values on an annual basis where they really truly should be, where other, other counties have done that. And I can say that because you build a home in Pocatello, Idaho for $150,000. You build a home in Idaho Falls, in that same exact home is going to cost you $300,000. You go to Twin Falls, that same thing is happening because of values. For some reason, in Bannock County, the assessor's office has reduced, or not reduced, but held those values low. And we have an assessor now that is saying the values of these homes are X. Now, we could argue whether or not they they did it all in one swoop, which they did. I don't think that was appropriate, and I don't think that was necessarily right, but that's what they did. So she's <coughs> bumping those values back up to where they really, truly, historically should have been all the time, and which is a sticker shock to most people when you get your values and you go, what do you mean my house went up 20% or 30%? And so those things, I mean, let's, let's keep all of this into perspective. I'm not saying we need to go and charge all the taxes we can because I disagree with that. I don't want to pay any more taxes than I have to. That being said, we have a city to run. We have a budget that we need to, to get to. There is a, a plan. We've gone through this budget for months and months and months. There is a, a, a way that we can do what we need to do, I believe. We've looked at it, we have done everything we can. Valuations, we don't have a lot of say in valuations. And so just think about that, please, while we're going we through it. Okay, so that, to say that. For, going on, what, uh, on, on your commentary, the State Tax Commission, when they were here last summer. Mm -hmm. in, the county, whole, in the county. During, when they were here. At the county. Yeah, when, yes. they, when, okay. when they had the big meeting at the courthouse, they debunked that story that there had not been compliance for 10 years. Because no. you have to, no, 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 please, let me finish. No, please because they have to comply year to year. The, the state does not let them not comply. So her story that we had not been in compliance for 10 years was a total crock of baloney. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is two thirds of my property tax bill, which, oh, by the way, is $8,800, is city taxes, not county. Okay. City. So that's what we need to work on cutting. Why such a huge percentage of everybody's property tax bill is city taxes? Why? Okay. With that, we're, I'm not even going to comment to that. We're just going to listen because that's what I really want to do is get through this so that we can have a, a discussion. Thank you. Ashley, go ahead. Okay, the budget publication, we published estimated property taxes to be $31,710,766. This amount is a $524,580 increase from fiscal year 20, and the change from the July 9th to the budget publication was due to a revenue error and interfund calculation changes. So we went through and we put all the expenses in and ran our interfund charges. That's why the amount changed. Okay, so this is what was published. And I just have a question. So that 524, 580 does not include, obviously, new construction. 
It does. But if new construction is 598, and then you had cuts, then you had a revenue error, and then you had some interfund calculations. So it's all, all, all right. together. So, so this number includes new construction. Yes. Okay. This is the accurate number based on what you have from the county. This is what was published. I will get to the county information okay. in a minute. By, by this number, what are we talking about? The 524. So the we estimated property taxes to be the 31 million seven ten. $766, which was an increase of the 524,000 to taxes. We went through, from the last meeting, we have been through the budget a million times. We have gone through with a fine tooth comb, realized that there was a little glitch in our system, got that all fixed. This is where we're at as of today. Estimated property taxes. This is after the adjustment for new construction. Okay, so we can only take what we took last year plus the new construction to be eligible for the state aid. So we would um, be taking property taxes of $31,343,115. Okay, so what that is is last year's property tax plus the new construction that we just got from the county, which is $156,929. That gives us an estimated shortfall of $84,759 because our estimated new construction isn't going to cover the way that we built our budget because we didn't get the amount that we thought we were going to get. Did we um, find out whether there was a mistake in that? Or? They're telling us that there was not. They're saying that all of the Amy's Kitchen was personal property, will not come on the tax rolls as new construction. We're still kind of working with them. I know that Jared was able to talk to him yesterday, so we're still um, in communication with them to see if that might change. But as of right now, my answer from the county is these numbers are correct. Okay. Okay. All right. So the mayor and I sat down. We talked to a few department heads. We put our, you know, we put our heads together and said, "How can we fix this estimated shortfall?" So we have a few ideas. Um, this slide is a little bit different. I will. We. We thought um, there was a call for, with the governor yesterday um, explaining that sales tax revenue has increased significantly, up 5%. We also saw that in our last sales tax remittance that the amount was up significantly from the previous quarter and from last year. Well, that 5% is up this first month of the fiscal year, state fiscal year. Yes, yep. The last quarter of last year was significant i mean it was a lot double higher. what we typically get in that last quarter yeah so so we our recommendation would be to increase sales tax revenue by two hundred and fifty thousand, and we looked at the highway user tax revenue um it does also look like it's going to increase we talked to tom he would feel comfortable with adding the revenue of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars the building permits that we were on there i talked to richard we had a little bit of a discussion didn't feel like that one um didn't feel 100% comfortable with that one. So we took that one out. We don't think that that would be a good idea to increase. So I want you to understand that if we increase these revenues as an estimate and we don't get these revenues, there are a few options for us. Um, we usually monitor these things, make sure that our revenues are coming in where they're supposed to. Um, if they're not, they're significantly down. We try to reach out and find out why. We also look at that point, the mayor and I work with department heads and say, hey, you know what? It looks like we're gonna have a shortfall this year. What can your department do to help us out? That's something that we continually do here at the city to make sure that we are covered. The other thing we could do is use reserves, okay? So there's a few options if the revenues don't come in at this amount. We feel pretty comfortable that they will, but I just wanted you to know that if they don't, we have a few ways to kind of remedy that issue. Okay, so the estimated now, property now, taxes. Ashley, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you. If, if they didn't come and if we decided to use reserves, that would come back in front of the council before any of yes. that was spent, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so they're 100% in charge of whether or not reserves are used or not. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So this would put our estimated property taxes at $30,743,115, which would be a decrease of $443,070 from fiscal year 20. So we would be cutting taxes. So this includes the new construction, and then we would be decreasing taxes um, if we were to increase these revenues. I updated the levy rate chart with the new valuations from the county. So that's why um, I updated it before the new valuations. We were at about 0 0.0097. When I put the valuations in, it dropped the levy rate to 0 0.0093. 
So you can see it's one of the lowest that it's been um, in the last 10 years. So if we take the recommendations that staff, the mayor and I have worked on, um, we feel like is a good place for us to be. We're actually cutting more than what we did on July 9th by adding those additional revenues. We're taking less in property taxes. We're still eligible for the state aid, um, which our portion is potentially 4.9 million, just depending on what happens there. And this is um, where it would put us. So we just, this is the end of my presentation. It's pretty short, but we did, you know, we saw an issue. We tried to fix it and bring it to council for um, guidance and decision. Rick? I'm curious about that sales tax projected increase. Is that local sales tax or is that online sales tax? Is that also included? I, that's not in the revenue sharing form. No, it's not. So it's just local tax. It's it's just the taxes that may be distributed to the city. Yes, correct. Yes. Chris? Um, yeah, at, at the recent county budget meeting, they talked about um, the impact of an extra pay period. And apparently, um, every, I don't know, seven to 11 years, um, entities that pay on a bi-monthly basis end up with an extra pay period. Uh, Bi-weekly or monthly? Bi-weekly. I mean, bi-weekly. Bi okay. Now, don't, don't ask me to explain why, because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but the county had to add 860,000 some odd dollars to their budget. We just had that happen in, I believe it was 2018. Okay. We had 27 pay periods. And the way that it normalized out was it was still 26 pay periods in a fiscal year. Okay, so yep. we're fine. Yep. I think it's like 20, 25 or 26 when that's gonna happen next. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? How, how do you wanna deal with issues that I don't feel were definitively settled Okay, let's get Roger and then we can talk about those. Roger. I'm, I'm going to go and say, and I, I, I hate to do this in front of all the employees, but the bonus is 350000 If we took 350000 off, we, we wouldn't be hurting so much in terms of our budget if this doesn't come in. I think we, and we can debate this all over again, but when we execute our pay plan, which we did, it may leave some people in the lurch, but we, we shouldn't be in the business of making bonuses, especially at this time. And I will say that I thought we were not going to be able to afford any pay increases. That's why I put in that we should at least address health care. And it was not the employees themselves that were the major part of our savings in health care. It was the group this council made the decision to take out of health care. That was what he said to us that day, that our greatest adjustment to our health care costs was by taking our retirees out. So I, for one, believe we could take the 350000 bonus, let things stand, and work harder to understand our inequities in our pay plan if we've got them. But just giving a overall 350,000 bonus to our employees at this particular time, I don't feel is responsible. I, and, and that is in lieu of the mistake that was made that I feel we made decisions believing we were cutting a million dollars out of our budget. Yeah. Um, because that little glitch you mentioned was two and a half million dollars. Three. What glitch? Three. The little glitch you mentioned, you said there was a little glitch and we fixed it. That was a two and a half million dollar mistake. No, no. I just, I, I honestly find it offensive that you're basically blaming me that you're, you're not getting it. No, let me finish, please. You're basically saying that because I made an error or you were misunderstanding my spreadsheet that employees aren't going to get a bonus. And I do not agree with that. I find that extremely offensive. I have worked on this. I understand an error was made. It has nothing to do with the decision that was made on July 9th. I 
spell that out for you guys right here. This is what was decided. I'm sorry if you didn't understand that the gap was including new construction, but I've tried to explain this a million times. So I don't know what else to do. But you, you showed us something that's never been shown before, that our reduction in the gap was inconsequential. We have not, in all of my time doing this budget, had somebody present that. And Ashley, I take offense when you say you couldn't find the, the uh, misappropriation when all you had to do was look in this budget digest you published and see that we were increasing interfund revenues by almost 38, $3,800,000. Yeah, I went through the whole that budget That should be a glaring, glaring, glaring thing to find. It was easy. Once, okay, that, that so, is so incongruent. So, so we're going to focus on a budget. We're not going to focus on personal attacks. Well, to no, the but council, accountability to is the, not a personal uh, attack. To the council and or to our staff. I want to just make something clear, though. This 1.5% this is not a bonus. It is a one-time adjustment to the, their annual pay. That no, no, no. It's not an no, adjustment not. because it doesn't go on. It will. It's a one-time adjustment this year to their pay, and their pay rebounds back to what it was last year. Which is no, a bonus. That's a bonus. That is that's a, a one-time adjustment to no, their you pay. Call it by what that's synonymous. It's, you wanna, you wanna it's kind of like code and, you want. and uh, ordinance. That being said, that being said, we have a, a budget here in front of us. That's what we need to focus on. Uh, Chris. Yes. Um, so um, has, I, I don't believe that we ever made a definitive decision about uh, suspending the USAR program. We brief, we mentioned it briefly. Uh, Chief Gates and I had a conversation during a break. Um, in that conversation, he indicated that there might be a way to at least um, partially fund that through a fee basis, and that the program, which is Urban Search and Rescue, benefits primarily several large companies in town. That's 31,775. I, I, my first question is, is that USAR program, did you include that in the current budget? Yes. Okay, I do not believe that we made, I certainly was not, clear that I had made a decision that that was going to remain in the budget. Um, I would like to hear Chief Gates's ideas, and then I make a motion. Um, well, I'd like to hear Chief yeah. Gates's ideas first. And I went back Chief. and looked at my notes while the Chief is coming up, and we did discuss that. Um, it was part of Chief Gates's budget presentation on, on May 8th, but then it was later in the list of our, in our tax solution meeting, was one of the meetings, in the list of the, and I know it, it's confusing, but the negative numbers that were included as potential cuts, and we went through and discussed all of those, we made the decision at that time. Actually, well, okay, I'm that's, not gonna get Chief. into an argument. I'd like to hear it from Chief Gates. Yeah, so Chief Gates, our, um, so the Urban Search and Rescue team is uh, a team that was stood up in the early 2000s. Uh, it was funded primarily from some federal grant dollars. Um, it's really what I would call the more technical side of rescue. It's not a service that we in the fire department traditionally would provide, but with the 9-11 and the need to stand up uh, the ability to uh, rescue people out of collapsed structures. Uh, it was decided that that was an important thing to put money towards. Um, we stood that team up, team up as part of a, a three-team statewide effort. And um, you know the, the things that we do are trench rescue, confined space rescue, and then what's called collapse rescue. And collapse rescue is, I think, pretty much something that we would want to do because that's we have an earthquake and we have some structures downtown that collapse. That's going to help us. But the whole cadre, when you talk about confined space, no citizen has a confined space in their backyard. Uh, that would be the one uh, attribute that uh, on semiconductor, Great Western Malting, 
a lot of the utilities all have confined spaces and they are required by OSHA to have a confined space team identified, a rescue team. Uh, probably the little oddity in this is that we've always been identified as that, but it takes a very special set of skills in order to affect that rescue. And so we've been listed on all of these companies' rescue team, but they don't contribute any money to us and they expect us to come out and provide training. We're supposed to go out and actually do an annualized uh, uh, event with them as part of their requirements for OSHA, but there's no funds that they contribute to us directly other than tax dollars. And so I guess from my perspective, and I have brought this up to city council a couple of times, trench rescue, confined space rescue are both items that I feel a common citizen probably should not have to fund. Uh, I think the businesses that warrant that, and I think you could easily have a permitting fee. We have not set that, we have not done that. I think that's something that I would, I guess, from my perspective, we don't want to disband that this year, but if you want to move to a fee-based system next year and look at that, um, I think that would be very appropriate. How that looks, I don't think it's going to take a ton of money. Um, you know, I mean, some of these uh, the utilities have a ton of confined space vaults. So I don't think we're looking at a lot of dollars. So. so Heidi? So how could we implement that to solve the problem if we've already published the fee? Yeah, we can't this can't, year. Right? That's what I'm, yeah. This year you cannot. You, we can you work can, that for next year. Yeah. This year the council, idea. if you wanted to do, I mean, if you wanted to keep it this year, you've got to keep it in the budget where it is. And then if you, and or if you want to postpone it or, or eliminate that right now uh, for a year so we can get those things together and task the chief to work with everybody and get that that thing, then that would be, pro I'm assuming that would be an option as well. Though not a preferred option, it doesn't sound like from the chief. And so it probably leaves our, our company. All the equipment that the state has purchased for us would have to be returned to the state. So we would be starting over. I would highly not recommend that approach. I would continue with the operation. It keeps people trained, it keeps them. You know, it is a skill set that's, uh, I was just talking with Chief Ahern earlier, it's a skill set that is complementary. Uh, when we talk about collapse and things like that, it allows us to recognize those situations, knowing what uh, skills and uh, uh, knowledge we need to go into those types of situations. So it is a complementary skill for the fire service. Um, I think, you know, if it were me recommending, I would say if that's the direction that the council would like to go for next year, that we work really diligently, we work with our businesses, we set up a, a confined space permitting program, uh, which has a lot of benefits. The trench rescue uh, concept is the same. And if I could just finish no, up. No, no, yeah, rescue. yeah. I think that one of the things that I've always felt about trenches is, is that we have a lot of people that dig trenches. I've actually gone on more trench death reco body recoveries um, than I have ever confined space. And the fact is that you have vendors who go out and they, they want to stretch. They want to dig the trench. They don't want to put the proper safety precautions. They get somebody to weld outside that trench. Well, when they do that, we end up having to go pull the body out uh, because that's normally what it is. I believe that if a vendor knew, a trenching vendor knew that we knew that they were digging a hole in the ground, that they were putting people in it, I think they would be less apt to run the risk of getting caught having their people work outside the box. Because we would be going by, we would know the trench exists, and we would be driving by on a regular basis. I think we'd prevent deaths, which is, in my opinion, even more important than just the simplicity of having to fund it. Sure. Um, so that's my perspective. Okay, Claudia. I just, I just had a question. So how long has USAR, how long has yeah, have you been doing? Early 2000s, I don't remember the exact date. It was about 2006, I think. Is and so for all these years, 13, 14 years now, these companies haven't ponied up a penny. Well, it goes long. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering how come it's been so long and no, it, it's never, nobody's ever thought that these companies should be paying for the service that they're getting versus the general taxpayer paying for the service that they're getting. I mean, I'm just, it's a, it's a question. It's not a, a an accusation. It's, it's not just, as well known. And, and I think there's kind of, I mean, nobody wants to pay more taxes. Companies don't want to pay more taxes either. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times they would send us, they would just 
I think the fire department didn't even realize that they were being identified as their rescue team. And this was long prior to we having the skill set to affect the rescue. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so all the way back, I mean, I joined the fire department in 94. 94, we were going up to on semiconductor doing confined space drills, but we didn't have the training. We didn't have people that were trained in confined space the way they should have. And we really shouldn't have been doing that. We shouldn't have said, we can. We should have said, we can't be your rescue team. We don't have the training necessary to do that. Mm -hmm. Chris. Yes, so what is it that costs $31,775 like, it, like if we don't suspend it this yeah. year, what exactly costs that much money? So, so when you go through my budget, each of my lines has different things. So we have a, a training line for USAR in order to send people to train. We have equipment lines for USAR. We have overtime lines that go along with the training and, and also go along with the response for USAR. So all those together, if I took out every single line earmarked for USAR, uh, out of my budget, then that, that equates to 30. So then if we're going to um, continue it for one year in its present form, my recommendation would be that we rely on the training that you, your team had last year, that the equipment that they had last year is probably serviceable for another year. And I would say, uh, in fact, I make a motion that would we remove $31,775 from the budget and continue to provide services for one year with a clear understanding that at the end of that year, the city will no longer provide USAR services with taxpayer funds. So, so your motion is to keep the program but eliminate the funding for the right. program? Right. Based, based on what the chief has said, I, I would say that the training, the USAR training that folks got last year is probably serviceable for one additional year, as probably is the equipment and et cetera, et cetera. So remove the money, keep the program with a clear understanding to those people who have been designating us that if they continue to want us, the city, to be the designee, then they need to pay for that service. Okay, uh, and we'll need to direct the chief to work with the corporations and stuff to, okay. Can we so, get his? So we have a yeah. motion. Um, I guess we just want to ask the chief, is that doable? Can you, if it has no money, are we keeping the yeah. I, I feel like if you, if you, it's a relatively small amount of money, and if you defund the system, we're in a constant flux. We, we have people that turn over the team. We have people that retire off the team. We have people that decide they don't want to be a part of the team. Um, and we have to kind of keep renewing that. So it's not just, it's not just continuity or con continuations of, of upgrading skills. It's it's even training people to, to do that. And I think that the amount of equipment we're talking about is all this stuff. I mean, we're talking saw blades. When we do training, uh, these are concrete saws, concrete drills, they're, they're probes that we use to go in. And it, there are expendables. And it's a pretty small amount of money that we're using. How many people are rotating, have rotated off? We or, try to keep about 18. Or are rotating off this USAR team to your knowledge and what is the minimum team since since I'm it doesn't sound as though as though we we do confine space so we train for it but we don't do it so what's the minimum number of people you have you need to be able to pull that off and um, can you get through one year knowing that there will be clarity at the end of that 12 month period. So to answer the first question, uh, 18 total people is what we're trying to maintain. Uh, we're below that right now. I don't have the exact number. Um, and I don't always know when somebody's going to decide they don't want to be a part of that. Um, What's so the minimum number that a USAR team needs to be 
knowing knowing that you're looking at a at a finite amount of time. I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, I mean, do you, do you need 18 people um, trained up and ready to go, given the amount of usage that the program gets, or would nine people trained up be adequate? The skill sets and the, the disciplines are always specific to the event. Um, if you look at a nationwide, what they call a type one, use our team is 72 people. We're not even close to that. Right. It's our wow. entire state and our participation in the state to affect that level of, of team. Um, and we're part of the state system, so we're trying to carry our share of the weight within the state so that if that event occurs, we can go. How many confined space rescues have we affected in the last 10 years? I can tell you that I don't recall a single confined space rescue, but one of the things that I guess I would caution you is the emergency services. We are an insurance policy. Uh, it's not, I don't know, I have paramedics that are trained in delivering babies, they've never delivered a baby. Do we want to say that they shouldn't be trained in delivering a baby in the field? I, I feel like it's a risk, you're right. I have a, I have a question. So when officers, firefighters get trained in this, what is the, commit, the, the, the time commitment on their end after they receive the training? Uh, we don't have a formal one. I don't think anybody goes to the program without seeing several, you know, at least several years. So if totally eliminating the 31,000 would cause major issues, is there an amount, what amount would you feel comfortable that you could kind of do Chris's suggestion and, and keep it going, at, you know, to keep it going, but not like maybe to the full level? Like, is there a midway point or anything that you, or are you just saying, no, absolutely not, or what? You know, I mean, I have a big budget. I guess what I would tell you is that we, we are not a line item entity. I don't yeah. manage everything by line items. It's a fund that has uh, some flexibility in it so that if I have a fire engine engine that blows up and I have to spend $25,000, then guess what? That normally comes out of that type of fund. If we want to narrow this down, there's always a narrow. I'll just be coming back to you and saying, hey, I need $25,000 to replace a fire truck engine. I guess the reason I'm drilling down on this is that it was one of the expendables that you right. offered in your budget presentation, and 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 so that was that was so, so. Some, that was a decision that you that you came to, and I my motion simply says let's accept your offer um, with the caveat that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll give the companies that benefit from this a year to adjust. Um, Aaron, Councilwoman Stevens, I, I guess, you know, no different than several years ago when transit was left with a short budget and they said, I'm going to, I'm going to shut down the least used. This would be the least used service that we have. So, um, it's not unused. It's not, uh, yes, we can shut it down. Um, that will leave businesses having to figure that out themselves. Um, but well, why? I mean, you were doing you you were doing it. You were doing it. You've been doing it since what? 08, you said, or 96 is when you came on. Well, so why would why would at this point now just cutting that money leave businesses without you still doing it? You've been doing it all these years. So so the standards change you know maybe back in 94 and i can't say this specifically but in 94 uh departments may have done things that they shouldn't have been doing but there once you recognize that this is the training standard in order to do this um, i'm sure there were people that in the days of emts practiced paramedic level skills that they should not have practiced that was beyond their scope we know that our scope of practice has to end here and if my scope of practice, if I don't have training for that scope of practice, then I can't tell them that I can be their rescue team. Okay, and so here's my other question then. Why, why do we have to wait a whole year to have these businesses 
I look better when your glasses are fogged up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why do we have to wait a whole year for these businesses to pay for this service? I don't understand. So why can't it go? So the, I'm sorry? It's not in the fee schedule. So we haven't published the fee structure with this in it, and so we can't charge a fee that the, has not been published and, and accepted by the council. So. And so because it hasn't been, we're, we're a year out if we want to, to do this. But I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. We have a motion on the floor. That motion is going to die for lack of second. If we want a different motion, then I'm interested in that, uh, if we want to do that. Um, but the discussion can continue on. I just want you to know that, for the record, the motion has died for a lack of second for now. We'll see what happens as we move forward. Well, yes? I'd like to, if I could, make a substitute motion. There's no substitute motion, the motion or, or, or died. A motion. motion. Okay. Uh, to leave this in for this year, uh, and then we can make a decision about making it a fee-based program in next year's budget. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. What is the discussion? I'm Chris. not comfortable with the idea that we keep kicking cans down the road and we keep saying, uh, for example, you know, oh, this is a placeholder. So we're saying, well, we're going to keep it in the budget and then at some, then we'll talk about it. I would like a decision. Unless I've uh, misheard you, misunderstood you, Chief, you said that you would be fine and would frankly recommend that these companies pay for this service in the future, that that would be very appropriate from your perspective. A am, am I, is that a fair summarization? I believe that's appropriate. Okay, all right. So therefore, I think we should take the Chief's recommendation and not leave it open-ended and say, and we'll talk about fees later, I believe we need a specific motion that says, we'll leave it in this year and the chief will work with the appropriate companies so that we are, and we will establish a fee basis to pay for this program this year. So that that's, you know, that's why I don't, that's the part of, of Councilwoman Lurick's um, motion that I can't agree with is the open-endedness when we have our chief saying that we have an appropriate. So, I'm just trying to understand, are you saying pay for it for like retroactively, like the fee no, no. pay for we, this year or are you saying for, for next this year, year And during this year, we establish a fee structure based on the chief's work with the appropriate companies so that beginning next fiscal year, this $31,775 is no longer on the backs of the taxpayers. But it would be for this budget. For this year. Okay, so yeah. I guess that's well, what I that understood her was what my motion would be. So well, you I said it will make a decision here. about yeah. fees later, yeah. and I, I well, may have missed Because it has to be part of next year's budget so, discussion. So, so I, guess, yeah. I guess there's a question in this statement that's being said right now. Are you, will, would you be willing to change your motion to leave this in the budget this year with the understanding that next year it will be fee-based. That's what I meant, uh, yes. Okay. That's, what, that's what you meant, and you're okay with the second. Okay, so I think that covers that yes. concern, and I think that, that we're in, in good shape there. Any other discussions that we have? And I think if the chief discovers that the businesses that potentially use this service are not willing to fund this, we drop the thing. Yeah, because it's yeah. their OSHA requirement, not ours. Well, that will be, that's that's not part of the motion, <laughs> but that's... No, but, but that's I'm just a, commenting on yeah. his comment. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Sense. I yeah. mean, that, that, that's the rationale. Okay. That sounds great. Okay, any other discussion? Okay. With that, we have a motion by Lurick and a second by Cheatham. Ruth, could you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Lurick? Yes. Cheatham? Yes. Adamson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Ortega? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question for you, uh, though, before you leave. If it's in the budget this year, next year, if it is not fee-based, does that 
make a change of working conditions as far as the union contract is. If it does, I'm just going to state this, if it does, you better work hard to prevent that from happening. Thank you, Chief. We'll try. Okay. I, I had a couple other, I think these are just understanding Thanks, questions relative to, to uh, fire and ambulance. Um, one, one is there's a, an item that was called Target Solutions, small amount of money, $4,610. I just don't know what that is. So Target Solutions is a web-based training delivery system, um, and it's a much, we have been using a system called Central Learn. Target Solutions is a much more robust, it, it, uh, Central Learn was primarily EMS based. Target Solutions is fire EMS and safety based. And so it adds a lot of uh, venue, uh, certainly under the COVID uh, issue. Okay. That, that makes it a lot more beneficial. And, and so this, so I'm assuming that Target Solutions replaces the previous and costs an additional 4,600. Okay. And then my last question under this category, again, is just to help me understand. I don't know what cultural assess slash change means. So we had a master, uh, Mayor Council, uh, we had a master plan conducted that uh, we received uh, at the end of last year. Um, one of the central tenant uh, recommendations was that we had a cultural problem within the fire department and um, recommended that we engage an outside vendor to assist us with that guidance. Um, that was what that money was for. Um, we had had a, one vendor give us, uh, actually the vendor that was recommended by the, uh, the committee that did the master plan and gave us a cost estimate of what it was. So that's a, a, hopefully one time. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Council. Any other discussion? Not with the fire chief. What was that? Not with the fire chief. Mayor, can I just maybe for a point of note, uh, the county has, they're in the same boat as you. They have not had the final uh, you know, approval uh, of their budget, but the budget that they have proposed to me from the county commissioners does include two firefighters under their budget and does include an EMS uh, person under their budget. So I just wanted to clarify that that, that is Great. at this moment in time, as set in stone as it can possibly be. So we don't have any of those in our budget bill. No. They assumed them all. No. Okay. They've assumed the two firefighters. The and the uh, EMS. Okay. Yeah. So, so those, we don't. Those, those were not in the public published in budget. Office. Those were never in the budget. They were always in the county's budget. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Heidi. Okay. Is it okay to. Need to still cover that? Sure. No, no, I think it's okay. Okay. Um, Mayor, I was also on that call yesterday with the um, governor and heard him talk about the uh, sales tax revenue um, and his team talk about that. So I move that we <clears throat> instruct Ashley to increase the sales tax revenue by $250,000. Everyone seems to agree that that is and that's a recommendation. Second. We have a motion second. by Adamson and a second by Lurick. Discussion, Council. Hearing none, Ruth, could you please call the roll? Yes. Keyhan? Yes. Ortega? I'll say yes, but I want to finish the list that Councilwoman Stevens well, is working off of. So yes. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Stevens? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So Ashley, if you would add that to the budget. Then Linda? Uh, I would like to make a motion to add the 350 to increase the highway user tax revenue by 350000 I also feel comfortable with 
that those numbers are better than we had expected. That wasn't on the call, so. <laughs> That, that wasn't discussed on the call, but the, the tourism is, we anticipated being down to 15 or 16 percent, and it's down four uh, as of uh, last month. And so those, those numbers I'm solid with, I would feel very comfortable, but that's me. I can't say. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Like, where did we come up with the. Yeah, with 350 on that one, like I just wasn't 100% sure where. So the initial reduction was 396,000. So we were thinking of maybe the 400,000, but we felt more comfortable at the 350 range. So we're basically still less than what we planned for fiscal year 20, but we're closer to being flat for fiscal year 21 to what 20 was. So we just felt the 350 was better than a 400,000. So we're staying a little bit conservative, but giving a little bit of bump. I just like to definitely stay on the safe side, so that's why I wasn't sure. Like, yep. does it is three fifty taking it all the way to like extreme hopefulness, or is that like still pretty conservative? It's like, still we go it's three still a reduction. Yep, it's still a reduction from fiscal year twenty. You're still reducing it by about fifty thousand dollars. So it's kind of just keeping the budget almost flat to what we did this year with a tiny bit of a reduction. So, so yeah. Tom is here, and I know he's got his thumb on the pulse of this. That <laughs> You'd like to hear anything? Sure, this is we're lacking a second. And we're lacking a second still on a motion. If I'll second it so Tom can talk. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, Tom. Mayor, Council, Tom Kirkman, Deputy Public Works Director. Um, the first, we get four remittances for highway user dollars. The first two of this year, we were over executing by a pretty good shot. So we, our numbers were really good. When COVID hit, we did see a reduction. Um, the state, as well as the city, we have traffic volume monitoring, and we're seeing numbers as good as before the COVID, if not better. Um, so that's where, when we look at that data, it just kind of drives me to think that next year we're going to be kind of right, we're back on board. So you're totally like 350 is a surefire bet or do you do you feel more comfortable at like three or do you think 350's the yeah, way to I, go? I, you know, nothing's surefire, but yeah. I, I feel very comfortable with the 350, okay. I really do. How are those funds expended actually? So all of those are used for, for street fund. And most of your street expenditures then occur during the fair weather outside of snow plowing your street improvements are all during the spring and summer, primarily. So if we did fall short, we'd simply have to cut some of that back in a year, correct? We always build our budgets for our paving program of this is what we want to get done, but if something happens, this is what we're going to get done. And so we always have that built into our plan of having a, a hold back if we need to. But I feel, I feel very comfortable with Okay, other discussion. Thank you, Tom. With that then, uh, hearing no other discussion, we have a motion by Lyric and a second by Bray. Ruth, would you please call the roll? Lyric? Yes. Bray? Yes. Adamson? Yes. Gina? Yes. Ortega? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Okay, thank you. Ashley, would you please add that to the, the uh, solution? And we have on our sheet, but you don't have it there, the um, new construction, and that's because you don't feel, we, we don't feel comfortable adding 50,000 for to, building permits. For correct. building permits and things like that. The building is, uh, we did, but then we, after further review, don't feel great about it. And so. Probably better to leave that mm -hmm. completely off. Okay. So, with that off, um, these numbers these are these numbers the, are still yes. Correct. I just um, I in, I updated the numbers. Forgot to take that out. So these okay. numbers are the correct numbers with just these two revenues in the okay. sales tax and highway user tax. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. So continuing on here. <laughs> um, 
and some of these amounts are small, but I'm just kind of a detailed person in that regard. Um, so um, I am curious, uh, under information technology, um, I, I need clarification. Uh, did we take either of the offered options from Infotech, one being eliminate Albert monitoring and the other reduce PC replacement? Plan? We took both of those reductions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, under library, um, I believe we took uh, everything except we did not reduce books and manuals and we did not reduce what basically sounded like bathroom renovations. That's correct. Um, so I am, and um, bathroom renovations is only $5,000, but you know, 10 dimes make a dollar. So um, I move that we eliminate the $5,000 buildings and structures bathroom renovation money from the library from this budget. Okay. So eliminate the bathroom at the library, the, 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 renovation. the renovation of the right. bathroom at the library. Okay. So when they were describing what that would be used for, it was for updating the tile and so forth. And so. Yeah. Okay, so I have a, count, a motion on the floor. I seconded it. Oh, you did? Okay. I, you're gonna, gonna ask council to speak up with these masks. Yeah, yeah, second. Okay. Thank you. So we have a motion. Any discussion on this? I prefer to maintain and keep our stuff. Um, okay. You know. Can I ask Eric? Sure, Eric. Eric Cease, library director. Is is that five thousand intended to make paid, or is there a functional use of that five thousand? Um, some of it is functional. There's some plumbing issues and some other pieces that are part of it. So, um, and, uh, and essentially some of the, the, the what do you call it, attachments, the various things that go into the. I'm sorry. Some, could you speak up? Sure. Um, some of it is the uh, the plumbing and the various other things that are part of it. It's not all uh, just to make it pretty. It's, it's, there's some actual functional uses that we need to make sure to be maintain or, or, or upgrade uh, so that we've got uh, proper working facilities. Roger. Is, is this calculated to help reduce some of the odor in those bathrooms? Because sometimes they... Um, it's not specifically yeah. to do that. Um, the, the effect will be that it will, will have an, you know, that it will help with that, but that's not specifically why we're really looking at function, function more than we're looking well, at. Well, it makes them more usable. <laughs> right, yes, and that's and that's the overall goal is that we've got a, a more a functioning facility, if you will. So I will withdraw my motion based on this information. Thank you. Okay. So the new motion has been withdrawn. Okay. Okay. Um, Chris? Yes, then under uh, recreation and zoo, um, and is John still John, on? He's still here. I yep, he is. Oh. <laughs> um, so um, one, so I don't know what we did at the end of the day uh, with the reduction in capital line item 004-1308-500-80.99, which is um, golf capital for the Riverside. We didn't reduce golf or zoo capital. Okay. We, those are both still in the budget. Okay. So then I would propose that the $24,000 um, for asphalt, pending John's um, info, uh, that we that we uh, reduce that twenty four thousand by half, and ask that they extend the asphalt 
So, okay. so, John, why don't you come over here? We don't have a motion on the floor. That was a proposal, not a motion. So if you'll come over here, make a discussion, and maybe it will form a motion, and maybe it will eliminate the motion altogether. Possible motion. Um, Council Member Stevens, so this, uh, the $24,026 that was, um, I, I guess, put on the table for potential 5% reduction, that was not to fund any asphalt replacement the next current fiscal year. Once again, it was a strategy to stockpile enough money to get the larger job done at a future date. So we, we do not have ample resources for that expense at this point. So if, you, if council were to vote to uh, take all or part of that, it would just kind of slow down that accumulation process. But, That's but, but, nothing specifically for next year. Right, right, because when I looked at the sheet, I. I think it said something about repair, but what you're telling me is that the asphalt that is currently there is not going to create a danger for anybody. No, it's not. It's it's not dangerous and it's usable, but it, it's just tore up. It, it's it, it needs to be replaced at some point. So this is part of the plan, the long-term plan yes. to get that accomplished. So if we cut it, we would be messing up the plan, right? Well, it's yeah. delay it a bit. Yeah. yeah. Other questions for John? Any other discussion? I think we should keep with the plan. So, Roger, I heard she, she had two issues. One was golf course and the other was the zoo. Or but we, we, didn't, addressing we didn't reduce the golf course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was just trying to... Same philosophy there. Okay. Right. You know, kind of stockpile for a bedroom right. clubhouse and irrigation system. Okay. All right. No, no. And then finally, I think this is probably a Tom. Thank you. Thank you. A Tom question, uh, or maybe first an Ashley question. So there were three options from street operations, um, each equaling $248,000. And I'm unclear if we, t if we accepted any of those options and if we did Right, so we, I think I explained this at the public hearing last week about we basically just, um, council said that Tom and I should look at it and recommend what we would think was best. We believed that just doing the street re reorganization and saving the 28,000 was best because it's always been um, that we need the money for street maintenance and every time we try to cut that, it kind of becomes an issue. So we felt that that was the best reduction, that's what we proposed and that's what's built into the budget. Okay, so so we did take we did take twenty eight thousand four hundred five. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much. That was easy, huh, Tom? That was great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ross. Okay, council. Direction. I think we've gone through this um, forwards and backwards and. Um, I'm very happy to see the levy rate projected to go down, so I move that we proceed as recommended by the staff. Ashley, Second. can, can okay, you tell us, with, with any changes that have occurred, can you tell us what that decrease actually is now? If it's, it's, the, it's the same as what's up on the screen right now. So we have a motion by Adamson and a second by Lurick. Now let's have the discussion. Okay. So the question was, what are the numbers with the decreases and stuff? It's right up on the and screen. And it's on the board. Right. So we didn't take it. Um, we are in the midst of a pandemic. We have a lot of people unemployed. We have some businesses that have closed down. I, I still think we need to discuss the one-time payment whatever, I'm calling it a bonus because that's what it is. It's on top of what normal earnings are. And I think we gotta discuss that. I, I think that we have the chance to get close to our million dollar target that we work towards. And I think that 350,000 was added believing we were going to approach a $1 million target. Right. And that's why I think we need to discuss it. Is that, in range, should it be reduced some? We need to have discussion. OK. 
Okay, council discussion on the, the one-time adjustment to the pay of two employees. I agree that that was, that was put through based on the fact that we were close to almost a million, we were at, at about a million dollars. And now that we're not anywhere close to the million dollars, I think that that needs to be reconsidered. I also think in our discussion, you know, we talked a lot about um, cost of living uh, and so forth and, and um, how employees need to be compensated uh, because of the, inc the increased cost of living. But every taxpayer in town is also impacted by that same cost of living increase. Um, and so right, wrong, or indifferent, it is what it is in terms of what property taxes are doing or property values, and therefore taxes have been doing um, very recently. And we have cost of living increase to our taxpayers, and so I fully support uh, taking the whatever it was, the one and a half, one, and a half one time slash bonus slash whatever we want to call it. I, I absolutely support pulling that out of the budget so that we can at least get close to a million dollars. And to show solidarity with the employees, I think that the council and the mayor's office should rescind the raises that they gave last year so that everybody is going, making the sacrifice. Okay, Linda, you had a... Yes, I think um, our job as council members um, is to balance a lot of competing obligations and needs. Um, and one of our main, uh, one main part of that, of course, is, is property taxes and to do what we can to keep those um, down and to keep them as reasonable as possible. But another part of that is um, to take care of our employees um, and to be able, it's not just about taking care of them, but help them to serve the community in the best way that they can. Um, they are public servants just as we are, only they're not elected. Um, but they do serve the public and I think it's incumbent upon us to help them do that in the best way we can. And um, I think the fact that we've been able to decrease um, property taxes and that we've been able to lower our levy more than we even had talked about uh, at the last point that we looked at that, um, that is managing to balance all those things and that's with the one-time payment in there. To me, the compromise was already made in the fact that it was only a one-time payment. I would have liked that to be a permanent raise. I think 1.5% is very low, um, and I think that that's, it, it's, it's already in there, and we're still able to do the things we wanted to do. And so that already was the compromise. But I am not in favor at all of taking that out. Um, I think we are behind market on, on most of our employees and most of our departments, um, and we need to be working towards getting that to where it should be. We need to keep good employees here. Um, that's our, our whole city benefits from that. Um, if we keep good people here and we attract new good people, um, that serves our city well. And I think to not be able to do that, and, and if we don't uh, pay them, fairly, then we won't be able to do that, and that doesn't serve our city well. So I think we've managed to balance all of the, the things that, that we needed to balance, um, and with that raise in there. So I definitely am in favor of keeping that in. And I, I should not call it a raise, a one-time market adjustment is what I will refer to that as. Well, uh, Claudia, then Chris. So I, I'm, I'm not super bright, but if we hadn't just increased the sales tax revenue by 250,000 and increased the highway user tax revenue by 350,000, that what would that 443,000 be, Ashley? That was my question. It would be an increase. 
Right. So we haven't actually decreased the budget at all. All we did was increase the revenue. There's a difference. You decreased the property tax. Mm -hmm. tax. But only because we increased the revenue projection. And so we're hoping that, so we're, be we're, we're, we're betting against money that we don't really have. And we don't know if we're gonna have it. So we're fine with we're, we're fine with doing that, but we're not fine with trying to reduce the actual budget that we spent. And I guess that's my fundamental problem. We we the only reason why there's a decrease. What would that number be, Ashley? The increase would be the new construction, the one hundred fifty-six thousand nine hundred seventy-nine right. dollars. So so really, we haven't reduced the tax ask. All we did was increase the revenue projection which decreases taxes we, but that's but it but, does. but we don't know but we Hold can on, I'm only not take that much in taxes we can't take more even if we have a revenue shortfall but we don't but we don't know what i'm saying is is that we haven't actually reduced the budget the actual budget what the what we spend has not been reduced that's the bottom line it has not and I think that that's what we need to be working to do. It's fine if we want to increase the revenue projections, but we, we, it is our duty, our responsibility to try to lean this budget, make it as lean as we can possibly make it. And I don't think that we've done that. And the 443,000 looks really nice up there, but it's not a reduction. It's not a reduction in the actual budget. So I certainly understand the point that you're trying to make on that. Um, the, the difference is in past years, we've always taken into the 3%. And so if we're not doing that this year, that does show that the council and the staff have come up with ideas and proposals and there have been cuts. We know, we know there have, I mean, we just sat and talked about the ones that we did take to operating expenses. So we definitely have, made strides in that direction now it, did it just drop like a rock no but that's very difficult to do when you're talking about still providing services that people but it should have considering the valuations went up so exponentially the well, last two years so it should all I'm have is we keep dropped kind of keep like talking a rock. the same thing over and over again and um and, and I know it's hard. There's things in this budget that I didn't vote to put in this budget. There's things, I'm sure all of us can say that there are things that we preferred or didn't prefer, but it's kind of a team effort. We all kind of got to weigh in during the process and this is kind of where we've landed. And I think all of us want to be smart about taxes. We want to be, you know, not extreme or causing them to go up. I definitely um, feel that way personally. And so I, I feel like this is a, a good step, so let's call for a vote, I guess, on that motion. Okay. Can I make a comment? The discussion. We've got we've had a, a the request to call for the the call the question. Yeah, and I so, will make an amendment. I want to uh, but, propose an amendment to the motion. I can do that anytime. Well, the question has been called, and so we'll go ahead and vote on that, and then we'll go from there. So. With that being yes, said, I can't amend it if it's voted. But the question's been called. The opportunity to amend the motion. I, I can say I'm not so. ready, Brian. I'm not ready well, to vote. And the I'm discussion. Then, then, then the simple thing is, is if the if the motion fails, then amend the motion and make the motion the way you would like to make the motion. The question has been called by the motion maker, uh, which was Adamson. It was seconded by Lurick. With that being said, would you please call the roll? What is the motion? What's the motion? The motion, would you repeat your proceed motion? As to proceed as recommended by staff. Proceed as recommended by staff. What does that mean exactly? Which is this right yes. was up on the screen to increase the sales tax and the highway user tax revenue and to publish the or create the budget ordinance as follows. Ready that's go. that's the motion. So with that, Ruth, would you so, please so call? So we're leaving in pay raises. Just want to make that yeah. clear. Yes. Well, that was the compromise. Pay, pay raises that we were and to bonus. Come up with. We've well, done but that pay was raises before. and bonus. It's both in there. I want to make that clear. Yes. Pay raises, adjustments, and bonus are, are all in these. Right. Okay. Steps and the one-time 
which is a total market adjustment. Market adjustment. Market adjustment. Which we, uh, I think we would be better off having okay, a thank study. You. I've, I've already let the discussion go further than I should have because the question had been called. Would you please call the roll? If it fails, then we will have those discussions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Adamson? Yes. Laura? Yes. Bray? No. Gina? Yes. Ortega? No. Nope. Stevens? No. Black? Yes. Okay, any other discussion? What's the point? I, I just, I think it's interesting that two major employers in town, being Union Pacific and ISU, are actually furloughing employees. Mandating and And mandating various kinds of, of pay reductions. And yet, we, as a city council, cannot find it in our hearts to have compassion for our taxpayers. So I don't believe that there is not compassion for the taxpayers here. I think there's a tremendous amount of compassion for the taxpayers. Just and, so, and so with that, Yes. But just one last quick comment, and, and Heidi kind of mentioned this, but one of the things that, that we have to do that is very different than a Union Pacific or ON or, or any private business is to provide services to our communities. And even with the COVID situation, even with difficult times, our obligation to provide those services doesn't go away. We still have to do that, and that still costs money. So we try to be as responsible as we possibly can, but we still have to do those things. Um, so I think slashing our budget is just not a possible thing to do. Okay, thank you. With that, then, uh, we are adjourned from the meeting.